What is postmillennialism and why is it an important eschatological understanding for us to have as Christians? Today, I'm going to be talking with Pastor Joel Webin. We're going to have a great conversation, give you the basics and an introduction to the concept, all that and more coming up right now. Welcome to this special edition of Real Christianity. If you're watching this on the video version of our show, we have Pastor Joel Webin from Texas with me talking about the, I would say, very important and very popular discussion of eschatology right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, This morning, I actually watched an episode from Jack Hibbs, Mm. um, who was on the news, national news, covering the discussion that it said 40%. No, actually, I think it was 60%. It was somewhere between 40 and 60% of American Christians believe that we are, quote, in the end times. Now, that is obviously just a... Really? Nobody's ever believed that before. (laughs) Wow. And so... That's novel. Uh, we we know as Christians who have studied their Bible that any time past the resurrection and ascension of Jesus that we are in the end times. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're going to talk about post-millennialism. What is it? But... We're going to also answer just some of the basic questions on what is premillennialism, what is dispensationalism, what is amillennialism, and what is postmillennialism, and how should those inform the way that we live and act as Christians. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of those topics that you can write a 900-page book on, and so we're we're going to go as deep as we can, and uh, Joel, I would say, knows more on this topic than I do. But we'll banter back and forth on this issue. So where do you want to start? Uh, I think it would be really helpful for your listeners. First and foremost, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. Um, But I think it'll be helpful for the listeners if, uh, and this is something I don't typically do. I typically uh, address things very, very, very long. (laughs) (laughs) You know, just very (laughs) thorough, painfully thorough. But I thought maybe we could just give them snapshots. Like here's a brief concise 30,000 foot view of all three positions. Yes. And then come in with a long form discussion and, and pulling out, you know, the implications. Okay, let's do it. Okay. So uh, let's start with, so pre-mill, all-mill, post-mill. Okay. Those are the three main positions. And technically you could say that there's really kind of four because pre-mill kind of has two subcategories, main subcategories of the historic pre-mill position and then the um, all too popular uh, dispensational pre mill position, and that's where you would find guys like Jack Hibbs. That's uh, that would also be John MacArthur. That's the Left um, Behind series. So if you subscribe to the Left Behind series right. of eschatology, yeah. that's dispensational premillennialism. Right, which is um, people, at least in Western culture, especially in America, um, I, I would say that most people, if, if you're saying what's dispensational premillennialism, that would be the equivalent of two fish, you know, swimming up next to each other in the ocean. And, uh, one of the fish says, uh, man, the water sure is nice today. And the other fish says, what's water? Yeah. You know, so uh, you're, <laughs> you're a dispensational pre-mill uh, long before you're um, a born-again, regenerate Christian. Yeah, th- this is something that <laughs> pre- dispensational premillennialism is essentially the air we breathe That's in right. America. Um, even non-Christians. Even non-Christians. Think in dispensational terms. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's the framework. Which that's is, water. Which again, we're... If we were fish just to have some basic history on dispensationalism, it wasn't a part of the historical doctrine of the church. It came out in 1830 mm-hmm. with the gentleman's name, Darby. Dar- Darby. Mm-hmm. Uh, gentleman's name, uh, uh, Darby, he is uh, producing a different way to look at the history of the Bible through mm-hmm. dispensations rather than through covenants. Right. And um, we don't have time to talk about that, but that is, again, it wasn't historic to the church. Mm-hmm. It had never been viewed that way prior right. to that time. And um, which is why it's different than the historic premillennial position. Mm-hmm. So I'll let you dive into premillennialism right. and, you know, what the millennium is and things like that. Yeah. So that was John Nelson Darby. And then it really was popularized a little bit later in 1909 by the Schofield Reference Bible. Yes. So Schofield um, really took Darby's thoughts and made them popular in the sense that 
this was, if you think of like the John MacArthur uh, study Bible or Reformation it has sprolls, you know, his um, edit notes and stuff like that. Uh, this Schofield Bible took dispensational, um, dispensational exegesis from Darby and put it in the margins. Yep. So, and it became such a popular Bible that, you know, all these people were reading this Bible and just thought, this is how you interpret the text. So, so it was a formative resource that essentially that shaped a generation shaped a generation of how they view eschatology that was inconsistent with how previous generations That's right. had viewed eschatology. Right. So we have three main views, pre-mill, uh, all-mill, and post-mill. Within the pre-mill, there are technically two subcategories, historic premillennialism and dispensational premillennialism. To draw that distinction very, very briefly is uh, the dispensational premillennialism is a novel position that's really only existed for about 150 years. Uh, that would be Darby and then popularized by Schofield. And in the Left Behind series, the big difference between that and historic premillennialism, which would have been guys as early as, you know, second century, like um, Justin Martyr. Yep. Um, the difference is that the historic premillennialism uh, doesn't um, emphasize or even necessarily hold to a rapture. Yep. That's the big difference. So your dispensational premillennialism is your quintessential uh, view that Jesus is going to come back for a secret rapture of the church, exclusively the people of God who are born again. And that's typically going to be a pre-trib rapture, meaning it's going to occur uh, before seven years of tribulation. And then after the seven years of tribulation, then Jesus will return a second time uh, to establish his literal 1,000-year millennial reign on earth, seated on a, a rebuilt temple, a Davidic throne, uh, ruling from the place of Israel. So, With um, the reestablishment of the sacrificial system, right? all um, of these things that... Uh, and in their defense, you know, they would say, uh, not because Christ's sacrifice isn't sufficient, uh, but this sacrificial, animal sacrificial system being reinstated would serve as a memorial looking back to the atoning sufficient sacrifice of Jesus and what he's accomplished in the strange, past. Strange, but yes. To be strange, yeah, strange, but it wouldn't be fair to say that that aspect is full-blown heresy. Sure. So, so all that being said, so the historic premillennialism is just the idea that um, pre, uh, so to make it very simple, premillennialism means that uh, Jesus is going to return before this millennial reign of Christ. Mm -hmm. So the millennium um, is, uh, well, it's a, it's a, uh, a sci-fi spaceship that was used by <laughs> Han Solo. No, I'm just kidding. That's not the kind of, um, that's the Millennium Falcon. Right. Uh, Falcon, but uh, no, the, the Millennium is, um, it's simply a thousand year rule and reign of Christ as king. Not yep. just savior, meek and mild, but as king. Now the question is, um, of course, that word um, Millennium refers to 1000. Mm -hmm. It's a numerical um, view. Uh, the pre-mill is going to believe that that's a literal 1,000 years. And what makes it pre is uh, really what you're talking about is simply the return of Christ. Does Christ return before the millennium where he rules and reigns for 1,000 years or after? So post-millennialism is simply saying that Christ is going to return at the end of his millennial reign. Yep. Pre-millennialism is that Christ is going to return before his millennial reign. And all millennialism um, technically, that word awe, it would be like... Amoral. Uh, yeah, amoral, you know, or, or asexual, asexual. Um, so it's the antithesis. It's that there is no millennium, um, but that's not fair to today's average all-millennial, you know, um, theologian. They would say, no, we, we believe in a millennial reign of Christ. Uh, it's awe in the sense we're anti or against um, a millennial view in the sense that um, we don't believe it's a literal thousand years and uh, we believe that we're in it right now, which is fair. You know, I, that's the same view as the post-millennial. But the big difference between all-mill and post-mill is that um, the all-millennial um, typically would date the beginning of this millennial reign of Christ um, at, at the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, mm -hmm. the inauguration of the kingdom. Whereas the post-millennial um, actually would date it in AD 70, that mm -hmm. the beginning of this millennial reign of Christ actually starts with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. So about a 40-year difference. So the all-mill and the post-mill disagree in, in two regards. We disagree 
a little bit about the timing, but for the most part, we agree on the timing of the millennial reign of Christ, but we disagree a little bit in regards to the start. Is it is it the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, or is it AD 70, approximately 40 years later in the destruction of the temple? Um, that's one difference between post-mill and all-mill is the start of the timing. Other than that, though, the timing factor of the millennium um, the, the time factor, post-mill and all-mill agree on, but the nature of the millennium, the nature of this rule of Christ in this millennial period, that's where the all-mill and the post-mill actually disagree sharply. The all-mill is going to see this millennial reign of Christ in a much more ethereal, spiritual sense. Whereas the post-millennial is going to say, it is a spiritual reign, and Christ is literally seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling in heaven, but he has all authority on earth and heaven. Which, of course, to be fair, again, I don't want to straw man, um, virtually every all millennial is going to say, of course, Christ has all authority on earth. But but the but they act, yeah, they act as if there is no true authority on earth because they've spiritualized, essentially, mm-hmm. the, uh, the millennium reign of Christ. Right. Essentially, there is no kingdom in history. In terms of uh, earthly right. history, there's no Human history. manifestation yeah. of that kingdom. Right. It only manifests in spiritual terms. Right. It only manifests in terms of evangelism, regeneration, church planting, insofar as church planting serves as gospel outpost for the purpose of regeneration. Correct. But it doesn't really... That kingdom is not, that mustard seed is not growing into a tree and that leaven is not working through the whole batch of dough in terms of culture, in terms of Christendom, in terms of art and science and education and media. Right. And so um, there's a lot of people who are all millennial who would really push back on the idea of a Christian nation. Um, And not just that, they'd have a problem with uh, a Christian school. They, they would say the only thing that really can be Christian is a person, an individual person. I, I've heard all millennial guys, some of the Westminster Two Kingdom, Radical Two Kingdom guys that have problems even with the idea of a Christian family. Um, you know, they, they they like it in the sense that they're Presbyterian and they have the, a, a new covenant understanding, you know, in, in terms of children being a part of the covenant if they're children of believers. But still, even then, they, they, they struggle with this idea of, are you really a Christian family, if not every single member of your family is regenerate. Yeah. And so we need to see that, yeah, between the amillennial and postmillennial position, uh, we have this, this kingdom that essentially isn't materializing. But we have to remember that as Christians, the evangelization of a nation should ultimately result in the Christianization of a nation. That's right. Because we know that our Christianity doesn't remain uninfluential in right. our decisions and on private. how we, it doesn't remain private because it, it changes the way that we do our banking. It changes the way that we do our finances. It changes the way that we run our businesses. It changes the way that we raise our children and the way that we educate the people in our home, the, the way that we consume media, the mm-hmm. way that we vote. It, it changes all these things so that when a person is regenerate, it should materialize into physical reality. Right. There should be a physical, tangible impact. And and that is really the glory of the kingdom of God or the radiance of the kingdom of God coming through Christ's people. Right. Um, So we believe the Christian faith is a visible faith. Uh, We believe that it's a public faith. And we believe that it's a potent faith. And I think that's my problem. And again, not trying to characterize or straw man, but that's my problem in general with many, maybe not all, but many all millennials um, is that, you know, I, I've often described it like this. Um, pre-mill believes um, that the kingdom is not yet, but soon. Post-mill believes it's um, already, but not fully. And all millennials believe that it's already, but not really. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not already, but not yet. Already, but not really. Yeah. It's already here, but not really. So we it's need to, an impotent kingdom. It's an impotent kingdom. And you have to know that in reformed Christendom, the vast majority of people are amillennial and postmillennial. In the reformed world. Yeah. In the reformed world. There is John MacArthur, obviously, and John Piper, um, and some of the other... Uh, theologians of yesteryear mm-hmm. were in that position as well. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Sinclair Ferguson or R.C. Sproul or... Um, Godfrey. Godfrey or 
Tom Schreiner, um, mm-hmm. you know, some of these great theologians that are here uh, are, are not holding that premillennial position, historic or dispensational. Right. And so when we talk about that, yeah, the, the premillennial has to recognize if you hold this position that they can't say that there's actually a kingdom right now. Mm-hmm. That's right. And, and, and that's kind of the vernacular of the Christian world is that, you know, we're going to do some kingdom work. Well, if you're a premillennial and you're going to be consistent with what you're saying, there really is no kingdom. That's right. Not yet. yet. Not, Not yet. yet. There is no kingdom yet. There is a church, uh, but there is no kingdom in the premillennial view. You're correct. And so um, my journey, and it might be helpful to share your journey, is that I went from uh, the fish that was wet in dispensational premillennialism. Mm-hmm. Um, studied at also the, the master's seminary for a time uh, under John MacArthur and uh, the faculty there, which I love dearly. Um, and then shifted into the amillennial position. Vody Bauckham sits right. in the amillennial right. position. And then, um, you know, having had uh, such a close relationship over the years with Doug Wilson, um, Doug had been, you know, continuing to show me a variety of perspectives on post-millennialism. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that that Augustine ho- held these positions and and arguably Calvin held these positions and uh, and the vast majority of Puritans held these positions. The, the founder of, of uh, Banner of Truth, Ian Murray, uh, holds these positions and Jonathan Edwards, which is arguably America's greatest theologian. Right. Uh, held this position and many of the Puritans, yeah, many if the, not if not half or over half, yeah, uh, uh, held the postmillennial position and and um, you know BB Warfield and right. Jay Gresham Mason and and some of the the men that I've really looked up to. And Surprisingly, actually, not Abraham Kuyper though he was all mill. Well, you know what's interesting is that I had to but read, he served the post mills well. Yeah, I, I had to read a lot of these Puritan works at the Master's Seminary. Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, there's there's a respect for one another. Right. None of these are heretical views, um, but it is important that you understand the difference between the pre-mill and that historically, and I would say the most potent Christianity in the last millennia was really that Puritan era. Mm-hmm. Like it was just, I mean, when you read Puritan work and the Puritan prayers, I, you just go, I'm not this mature. Right. I'm not this aggressive or assertive or invasive or intense about the gospel, but they are. Mm -hmm. And so there's something there that was driving them. And the Puritan, American Puritans, particularly, I mean, you have William Perkins and guys who, you know, you you have the English side of things, but then you have the ones who came to the new world. They especially, um, it was their post-millennial eschatology that, that was drive the driving force that caused them to be able to risk life and limb yep. to cross oceans to start this new world. They really believed that uh, that the society, that the churches that they would plant first and foremost, um, and that the families that they would build, um, the 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 posterity, you know, that they would have, that this would be a city on a hill. But they also believed that the society that they would build at large, the cities the colonies, the nation that would become out of this American experiment would be a city on a hill. And not in the same uh, way, in a one-to-one ratio with the uniqueness of the nation state of Israel under the old covenant. Um, They were using that language because it's good language and it was true and they were right. Um, They weren't saying that America would be um, the replacement for Israel. Mm -hmm. If there's any replacement, which I don't appreciate that term, it comes actually from a pejorative of replacement theology, but if there is any replacement for Israel, it would be the church, not America. But America has been a city on a hill, not in the same light, not in the same way. Um, But there has been no nation in the last 500 years that has been more benevolent, that has lent towards um, eradicating poverty, disease, crime. Uh, That is, I mean, when you think about just even the world economy, and I'm not talking about a globalism that comes from uh, Klaus Schwab and the guys, you know, who are maniacally laughing and trying to, you know, end everyone's life, but a a good sense of globalism is still with the distinct sovereign nations, but being able to participate with one another in such a way that um, economies flourish and, uh, and that cost of living is driven down and innovation is on the rise. That was accomplished by America, not being the, the world police, uh, but as Doug Wilson has said it, being the world coast guard, making the seas, getting rid of pirating and allowing for nations to be able to interact and engage at, at, at the level of markets with one another. Um, America has done all of that and more. And in that sense, it has been a light to the world. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yes. Amen. 
Amen. So, so where do we want to go? Yeah. So I, I would say, okay, so with premillennialism, there's three main things. Um, it's that Christ's second coming, coming, it's pre, it's right before the millennial reign. And they would hold, the second thing is that it's a literal thousand years and it's at some point in our future. And then the third thing is that premillennials, whether it be historic or dispensational, but especially the dispensational premillennial, is going to see the world is generally getting progressively worse until Christ finally returns. The postmillennial is going to believe that Christ's second coming will follow his millennial reign. So we believe that we're actually in the millennial reign of Christ right now and that his physical return that's in our future, not just in the future of, of the immediate audience that the New Testament writers were addressing, but in our future as well. Here in, you know, in the 2000s, we believe that uh, that Christ, his physical return will come at the end in our future, and that will be the end of the millennial reign. Uh, we also believe that this millennial reign is not a literal uh, thousand years, very likely it could be 10,000 years, 20,000 years, um, and it's comprised from 8070 to all the way to Jesus' final physical return. And we generally see the world as getting progressively better. Um, not that there aren't dips and spikes along the way, just like uh, the stock market. There, you know, it's not a perfectly, um, a perfectly um, inclining line. There are dips and spikes along the way, but the trend is generally up. And then all mill, the three things about all millennialism would be Christ's second coming. Um, again, like post mill, will follow the millennial reign. We're currently in that millennium. It's not necessarily a literal thousand years, um, but it started. The millennium is comprised uh, from the time. Of, um, of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, and it will end with his second, his final physical return, which is in our future. And they generally see the world as be, being conformed more to the image of Christ, but allowing for an up and down struggle between good and evil until Christ's return. The world won't necessarily always be progressing or digressing. Christ will return when he sees fit. And he could return at a down point or an up point. But overall, the world is going to be kind of, kind of, at an equilibrium. It's not, it's not this trending up. So those are the three main aspects of those. And, and I guess the easiest way to say it is that um, pre-mill and post-mill, we agree on the nature of the millennial reign of Christ. And then all mill and post-mill, we agree on the timing. So when you think of the millennial reign of Christ, this time period where Christ is ruling and reigning in human history, um, you and I as post-millennials, we agree with our all-millennial brothers in regards to the timing. We both agree that we're in the millennium now. Yep. Um, but we strongly disagree on the nature of the millennial reign of Christ. They believe that it's more so an ethereal, spiritual reign, whereas we think that it's a um, it's spiritual and strongly physical with tangible results. But the pre-mill, when I look at someone like John MacArthur, and he talks about what the millennial reign of Christ will be and what it'll look like, I'm like, I've got more co in common with him than I have the Amil brothers that I have in Christ. Um, because when he talks about Christ ruling and reigning, it's a real, real deal, tangible, physical, earthly reign. So I would say that, that the post-mill and pre-mill agree on the nature of the reign of, of Christ. And the post-mill and the all-mill agree on the timing, which means, I like saying this to listeners because they think post-mill is this extreme view. It means that post-mill is actually the middle view. It's the moderate view. You have pre-mill on one side, you have all mill on, on the other side, and they disagree about everything. All mill disagrees with pre-mill on timing and nature. But we over here, we share one piece with all mill, one piece with pre-mill, which means if you want to be just a, a America's um, evangelical sweetheart, moderate position, <laughs> post-mill is the position for you. Well, I want to talk about this, <laughs> this difference between optimistic and pessimistic eschatology. Okay. Because essentially, yes, you, 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 see in the premillennial or the dispensational premillennial position a pessimistic eschatology. It means that you believe that the world will progressively get worse until Christ returns and rescues his church um, from the failure of the world. And the postmillennial would have an optimistic view, meaning that we believe that the Great Commission will be fulfilled, mm -hmm. uh, not because we as the church are so great, but because Christ is the one, the head of the church that is doing, uh, he's the one that is actually moving the needle as it, uh, in regards to the establishing of the kingdom and the saving of his people through the proclamation of the gospel by the power of preaching mm -hmm. or reading the word. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
we believe, uh, like you said earlier, and Jesus explains that the kingdom of God is like leaven that leavens the whole lump. Right. And that slowly over time, over the centuries, as more and more of the world is converted to Christ, which we are seeing, today we are at um, approximately 30% of the world is professing Christians. Right. We know that as obviously an inflated number in the sense that are all those individuals regenerate? No. No. Um, but there is a continued growth. The church will never get smaller. It mm -hmm. never has historically. We have enough evidence historically of 2,000 years at this point to realize that the church is not going... Why would we believe that the right. church is going to get smaller? Because that would essentially say that Christ is failing to convert sinners uh, but he he never fails to convert sinners. Right. And he, some particular enemy of Christ in the Christian gospel actually is more powerful than the gospel itself. Secularism, I think, within this, our current point in church history, I think secularism is one of the most formidable enemies that the church has faced thus far. Um, but I don't believe that secularism is stronger um, than, the than Christ and his kingdom. Yeah, and the potency of the gospel uh, which is the power of God unto salvation and not just for um, the Jew, but for the Greek and for the whole world. And so um, I believe that secularism will fall. In fact, I think that secularism in many ways is already falling, um, yeah. that it, it is a, a self-defeating ideology. It's a suicidal, you know, it's a parasite. So secularism really only, just like socialism and it all of its different aspects, right? It's not a viable, tenable position. It's it's parasitic and it's not symbiotic, right? There, there are certain things that we find in nature where, um, this certain plant can support this other plant and the plant that grows on top of that, you know, original plant actually benefits that plant. It's, you know, it's mutually beneficial. Um, but secularism, it only, it only erodes and, and like a parasite eats and ultimately destroys its host. Um, and as Christendom continues to wane, um, the host is dying or at least on the surface appearing to die as Christendom begins to erode, um, secularism actually erodes with it. Mm -hmm. um, be, because it only secularism only really looks um, potentially successful um, when writing off of the prior foundations of a Christian society. Yep. And so anyway, so secularism will actually defeat itself. Um, and then we'll immediately see, well, we've got to return to something. We need a standard. We need this. We need that. We need Christ. And people will return to Christ and, and the gospel will be preached. And so that's one other aspect that's worth mentioning with postmillennialism is it's not just believing that um, it, this is one of the common questions. I don't know if you've gotten this, Dale, but one of the common questions I get from my listeners is they say, can you tell me, Joel, how postmillennialism um, and, and a general equity theonomic view, those two things, general equity theonomy with post-millennial eschatology. Can you tell me how your position, Joel, is different uh, than Bill Johnson's position with Bethel and the mm -hmm. seven mountain mandate? Yeah, that's a, it's an important thing to discuss right now because a lot of people go, when you say as a post-millennial, take dominion, uh, mm -hmm. And talking about the the cultural mandate in Genesis, uh, uh, in the first chapters right. of the Bible, right. people think that we're confusing with um, the charismatic movement that's exactly. behind Bethel. So, so explain that, the difference between those right. briefly. So yeah, so there's many differences, but I'll do my best to that and briefly point of your question. But uh, C. Peter Wagner is often viewed by many as kind of the father of that seven mountain. And guys, you know, Schaefer gets, uh, Francis Schaefer gets a bad bad rap for that. It's, it's not his doing. He was mm -hmm. great, but he's often used a lot of his, because he talked about how there's seven main realms, right? We have three sovereign spheres, the home, the church, and the state. And these are all instituted by God himself. God instituted the family, the church and the state. Um, but there are other realms of human society outside of those three sovereign spheres. Uh, for instance, um, economy, markets, vocation, uh, media, entertainment, Civics. right? Education, um, education, uh, the family, that, that sphere is responsible for education, but that is another um, realm. And so all, all that being said, uh, the point is, you know, Schaefer and other guys, you know, really coined this idea of there are seven mountains, seven different, you know, aspects of human society. And we want Christians, we, we want all seven of them to be Christianized by the Christian gospel. We want Christians to be influential in the Christian faith to win out in each of these realms. Now, and if we don't, there, what's the alternative? I mean, right. that, that's well, really, the, the, exactly. there, is, there is no neutral ground. Exactly. Because if it's not Christian art and media, what will it be? It will be demonic. Yes. Uh, you cannot share, right? You cannot eat at the table of demons 
and the table of Christ. That's why Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, when he's talking about food sacrificed to idols, um, Paul doesn't allow for any neutral ground. So, so Paul actually says, he admits, he says, well, in a sense, you can eat the food sacrificed to idols because uh, idols are no gods at all. There's no such thing. As they're, yeah. they're fake gods. They're not real. It's out of the same piece of wood. You chop off half of it to throw in your fireplace to stay warm during the winter. And the other half you carved in, into the image of, of an ox or an eagle and you bow down and worship. Like it's silly. Yep. You know, Isaiah talks about that and Paul talks about that. And he says, because these gods aren't even real, they're objectively fake. Um, a Christian with faith and a clear conscience can eat the, the food sacrificed to idols. But then there's another sense in which he says, but but in, in participating in the, the rituals and the practices of these cults, he said, um, although the God that they serve is not real, there is a God that behind it, a lowercase g God behind it that is real, and it's the demonic God. It's yep. Satan. Yep. Um, and so he says, Christians cannot, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Uh, Christians cannot eat at the table of demons and eat at the table of the Lord. These are two contradictory positions. And so all that being said, neutrality is a myth. There's no such thing as moral neutrality. Christ says this himself when he says, a man is either for me or he is against me. And so, so, if we're not for Christ, if we don't have Christian art, we have satanic art. And that's the trend is when you abandon Christian principles, you may it may not look like Satanism. You might say, Joel, you're, you're being extreme. That's hy- hyperbolic language. But then what's the story that we just recently saw with the, um, it's some clothing line that Kim Kardashian, I guess, you know, oh, yeah. sponsors for. And they had they had little teddy bears dressed up in S&M leather whips and, and, stuff, and kids holding it. And it was this big scandal, yeah. Balenciaga. Is that the, I think yeah, that's the name that's of it. That's right, yeah. Well, and, and people are like, that's crazy. Uh, and it's like, no, they, they can't help themselves. They well, cannot help themselves. You reject Christ and you are eating at the table of demons. And if we don't have Christian politics, what we do have is what happened three days ago, which was a rainbow-colored White House. Right. And so there is Christian politics. Yep. And there is... Christian art. And there is, But then there's demonic politics. That's right. right? Um, and, yeah. and so is if we don't... Christianize our policies uh, that govern our nation. Uh, and I always argue for people that the most loving thing you can do is vote for godly leaders to enact righteous laws. Right. That's, that's, the, that's loving the, your neighbor. That's loving your neighbor. Mm-hmm. And, and it's loving to make it illegal for them to murder their baby. Right. It's a loving thing to make it illegal that two men can't get married. Yeah, how many neighbors, unborn, preborn neighbors, preborn is the term I should use, but how many preborn neighbors in in my state of Texas alone have been loved rather than killed um, simply because Roe was overturned? Yeah. And how was Roe overturned? Uh, conservative Supreme Court justices. And how did they get placed? Uh, people voted for Donald J. Trump. Go figure. God draws straight lines with a crooked stick. You know, like, yeah. I, you know, but... Um, and, and then you think like the last two years, Afghanistan, 13 service members died. Was that loving to our thir- those 13 neighbors that we had? And, no. and all, all everything that's come out of that, all the people that lost their job because of forced mandated vaccines. And um, you you think if, if, if Trump had won the 2020 election, and this isn't even to make a case that Trump's a Christian. I, Trump would not be an elder in my church, nor would he be an elder in yours. I don't know if he's regenerate. I hope so. And I think it's possible, but, but in many ways it seems unlikely. Some of his rhetoric around um, uh, repenting and asking for forgiveness, you know, those, those kind of quintessential yeah. lines. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe he said that. So I'm not even making a case that Trump's a Christian. But what I'm saying is um, that if Trump had won the 2020 election, um, our neighbors, not just in the United States, but because the United States is so influential around the world at large. And you think of, of, of all the stuff with the Nordstrom, uh, Nordstrom pipeline and the energy crisis that Europe's about to um, to experience as we're going into a cold winter. And you think about, would Russia actually invade with Trump in office? Would that have changed things in Ukraine? You look around the whole world and you can make an argument that millions of neighbors would have been better loved. I'm, and when I say loved, I mean the way that the Bible, the book of James talks about love, being clothed and warm and well-fed. Um, millions of neighbors globally would have been better loved in a biblical definition of tangible physical love for neighbor uh, simply by voting for Trump. Yeah, and it's not That's because crazy. and it's not because uh, of Trump in the sense of that we are, you know, hey, go vote for Trump. It's that he was the better alternative he of was two, the best vote. Uh, of two not Christian options. Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah, so it's not to say Trump's the best guy in the world, although he he is objectively the best president in my lifetime. 
Yes. And that's not to, and, and, and that said, term, back to your point, it's yeah. a low bar. Yeah. Looking at, looking at <laughs> it's policy, a it's a low bar. And yeah. so, yeah, we're, we're talking about how do we find, um, we're not trying to find uh, Christian candidates. Ideally, that would be great uh, yeah. to, to find regenerate candidates that are we do wonderful. Want to find them. Um, but um, we're not talking about that in that specific situation. But we're also doing the best with what we have. So all, all that back to the C. Peter Wagner and the Seven Mountain Mandate and d- the dominionism um, that, that gets um, a bad rap and rightfully so, um, like Bethel and Bill Johnson, those kinds of things. I would just say that the big difference is one, um, the, the theonomic post-millennial, guys like, like Greg Monson, guys like you, guys like me, guys like Doug Wilson, we believe that the world's going to get better in real tangible terms. Um, but we believe, and this is the linchpin, we believe that because we actually think that, that through the preaching of the gospel, there's eventually going to be more people who come to faith in Jesus Christ than those who don't. Yeah, and we believe that that it's going to happen over the generations. Over because thousands people, of years. The problem is that when you have a pessimistic eschatology, you look out your neighbor and someone stole your Amazon package and you're like, the world's coming to the end. Right. Jesus come back, yeah. right? And so every essential, every bad experience it's or sinful experience bias. is a confirmation bias for why the world's getting worse. Well, the reality is you have to also look that, man, there's people coming to Christ uh, you know, in India and in the Middle East and in, in Brazil and Cuba in, in great numbers. And there's people that used to beat their kids now that now love right. their kids. And there's people that used to be alcoholics that are now set free. And there's people that used to look at porn. And we, we don't see those things. Right. But we know that the church is continuing to grow because the power of Christ is behind it. And so that we can say, hey, you know what? The world's going to get better. We might be in a downturn generation where the West is going to get flattened in judgment of God so that it ra- raises up another generation that's going to take uh, a stand for the right. gospel, take a stand for the truth, and we're going to see prosperity of the gospel, not the prosperity gospel, but prosperity right. in the gospel in the sense that it's continued to convert and change something maybe that we saw here in the 1700s in, right. in America. Um, right. we, we might see that again, but it's going to, it might take 200, 300, 500, exactly. thousand years from now for that to happen. So those are the changes is one, we, we believe that things will get better because we actually think it'll be bottom up. It'll be grassroots. It'll be the gospel being preached and just bona fide, good old fashioned religion uh, converting the heart. The, yep. the, the gospel actually produce a mass amount of Christians. The 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 charismatic seven mountain mandate. Um, they believe that that ultimately that the Christians are going to change the world top down by getting uh, uh, Christians in the right positions of influence and power in each of these things, which which we do want to see that happen. Um, but they, they think that, that that's going to happen first. So you could have 10% of the population that's Christian, but these um, influential Christians can get into these these levers, behind these levers of power, and they it's believe... It's saviorism. Right. And they believe that these individuals will have more power um, as as saints prop them up and pray for them. So it, it's, it's this idea of uh, we're going to fast and pray for so-and-so, and he's going to be exalted. And as we pray for him, it's like it's like this... Christmas, you know, cheer that's going to uh, make Santa's uh, sled fly as, and, and he's going to win this election and then he's going to be able to put in this policy. Um, whereas all, we need saying, is, all we need is one Christian governor right. and that's going to change everything. Right. And it's going to happen relatively soon. And so what you're saying is absolutely right. We, we believe the difference is we actually think there's going to just be a ton of people who believe in Jesus and we think it's going to happen over time. Yeah. So, so yeah, we don't believe that in the idea that oh, we just need one Christian governor and that's going to change our state. No, we believe that you need to preach the gospel faithfully to thousands upon thousands of people. And as the Lord regenerates those people, those people will essentially Christianize their lives. And that's how you get the Christian governor. We're a democracy. Now, of course, we are a representative constitutional republic. Praise God, we're not a raw democracy. But I'm just saying in terms of electing officials, we do that through a democratic vote. Uh, so we believe within the post-millennial framework, like we do want Christian governors and we want a Christian president. Amen. How do we get that? We get that by 50% of the population plus one being born again yes. by the preaching of the gospel. Yes, and that, that is exactly true because we know that um, the way you change culture is primarily uh, th- you have to change minds. Um, and the way you change minds is you have to change hearts. Yes. And the way you change hearts is the gospel. And That's so we're right. going upstream. Right. And we're going, well, if you change the heart, and, and I don't care if it takes 250 years to change uh, this state that we live in or this town that we live in, we're going to be faithful by pr- 
proclaiming the gospel, a multi-generational faithfulness that's right. going to be um, father is handing down faith to son, son's handing down faith to grandson uh, because the gospel is being proclaimed. And we're going to see that multiply across our city and, yeah. and change the city over the next generation or two or three or four. And, and what that does is it causes Christians to care about uh, the same types of people that Jesus did. Because when you're thinking like a politician or if you're thinking like the seven mountain mandate or you're thinking about, you know, the way that um, your sophisticated gospel coalition, you know, kind of person might be thinking, um, you're thinking about high up people, influential people, important people, you know, but it's different than what Paul said. Like not many of you, when the gospel came to you, were wise, wise. or understanding or of prominent position. Noble. Yeah. And and then you think, all right, how many Christians are there now? 30% of the world, 8 billion, you know, give or take. So it's like, I mean, that's that's a lot. I mean, the 2.5 billion Christians. And, and what did it start with? Um, it's not just that it started with a small number. Now we have a big number, but it's also not just the quantity change, but it's the quality. Jesus started with fishermen. Mm -hmm. He started not not with a bunch of Roman centurions and not even with the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees in or the philosophers, in the, yeah. right in the positions of power within Judaism, uh, Judaism. Uh, but he actually started with with the grassroots. He started with all. It's like your hillbilly elegy um, yep. kind of thing, and that's part of the reason why Trump won was because um, just your your true blue conservative uh, who just salt of the earth, blue collar kind of guy, you know, just doing his best to get by and holds to, you know, traditional marriage and those kinds of things had been made fun of and mocked, publicly mocked mm -hmm. on news stations and on every television show and every Hollywood production for, for decades. And then they all went into the voting booth where they were anonymous and where they wouldn't get punched in the face for in, and they voted uh, for a giant middle finger to all the elites, namely Donald J. Trump. And, and Trump, you know, has his problems. But my point is in that sense, you know, I remember one of the things that he said that, that was true and, and good was he was like, they don't hate me, they hate you and I'm just standing in the way. And I think that there was something there that was a unique movement. And I'm not even saying that Trump is, is the way forward because I, I kind of prefer that he wouldn't be. But, uh, but what I am saying is, but there is something to that, that there's an essence of, of those who are forgotten. That's where the, the gospel goes into the byways, not just the highways, but the byways. It goes, I think of the parable of, you know, like you go and invite all the, the, the invited guests, but they reject it. They don't come to the wedding banquet of the yeah. lamb. And then, you know, the, the, Go out the in the streets. Sends them to all the people, you know, to the homeless and to the people who never would have been invited. Um, and I feel like that's what the gospel does. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it goes to the least suspected individuals, um, but it reaches many. And then the masses at a grassroots level ultimately come and topple em empires like Rome. Yep. is overthrown by peasants. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the thing is, is that every generation before this, I mean, you know, you don't build thousand year long cathedrals right. if you think that Jesus is coming back on Thursday. Okay. <laughs> right. you, you, you don't, um, you don't build Cambridge and Oxford and Princeton and Harvard and Yale as the Christians did. Mm -hmm. If you think Jesus is coming back on Thursday, you, you have a long view of history and a long view of the future, which is this optimistic that the kingdom will continue to come about through the power of the gospel because of Jesus Christ, who is behind that. And he will not stop converting sinners into saints mm -hmm. and, and that the word of God is powerful, that the law of God is powerful, uh, that the moral standards of righteousness uh, for how we should dictate our, our lives is powerful. The truth is powerful. And so there's so much there. And so we got to stop talking because we were going I along. Um, and I, I do want to talk about a handful of resources that we can just leave people with to go Great. on. One thing that was helpful on my journey, just at the beginning, was R.C. Sproul's... Um, last Days According to Jesus. Last Days According to Jesus on YouTube. It's on Amazon. Yeah. It's on Amazon. You can watch the the, 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 the videos of it. But he talks about what's called partial preterism, right. 70 AD. Um, and, and that's really helpful. Uh, Doug Wilson... Dr. James White. Yeah, Doug um, Wilson, When the Man Comes Around, is yep. his commentary, but a brief commentary and engaging and, and, and even humorous at times in typical Wilson fashion. But it's uh, When the Man Comes Around, a, a commentary on the book of Revelation. Yes. Really helpful. Last Days, uh, According to Jesus, that's Sproul. Yep. That's really helpful. That's um, Matthew 24. Postmillennialism Made Easy by Kenneth Gentry. Yep. 
He shall have dominion he by shall have d- Kenneth Gentry. Yep, yep. So um, Keith Matheson wrote a piece on it, um, a book on it, who's a Ligonier guy. Um, mm-hmm. And and so there's uh, there, there's lots more. Jeff Durbin is also another gentleman that's uh, that's in the post-millennial position. And for him, position. just if you like to watch stuff like this rather than read a book, yep. I get that, you know, then... Uh, Apologia, just go to Apologia and check out. And type you've, in you've had uh, uh, Joel. Joel has a ministry called Right Response Ministries, and has got a YouTube channel with lots of videos and lots resources of stuff. and lots of videos interviewing guys like Jeff and guys like Doug and guys like me mm-hmm. uh, there as well. So lots of resources for you there. Um, and we don't want to persuade you necessarily to go into the post mill position in this episode. What we want you to do is to know that there is a valid alternative within orthodoxy that has seemed to be missing for a few generations, yep. but was absolutely prominent in previous generations. And so uh, check out uh, post-millennialism, look into it some more. Um, don't just adopt a theology because you grew up in a certain way in a certain church. Actually understand the positions and make a decision based off scripture. Um, and post-millennialism takes a bit. It takes a bit of time because you have to have a rich understanding of the Old Testament. You have to have a rich understanding of the New Testament. You have to, uh, it's, it's, it's theologically dense. Yeah. And so, so just be patient on your journey. Uh, it took me several years. It took mm-hmm. you several years. Mm-hmm. And so uh, just continue that conversation. But thank you guys for joining us. Um, I, I would recommend you follow Joel on uh, his, his podcast, YouTube his YouTube. Um, you know, he's on Twitter as well. And so, um, as always, if you're a regular listener to the show, could you guys leave a review? You don't need to uh, type anything. You just need to tap the stars. But if you do write something, I will read it. And we are blessed by your listenership. Uh, this is Real Christianity. My name is Dale Partridge, Pastor Joel Webin, and we will see you guys next time. Mm-hmm.